The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. You may remember from last week in Jesus' teaching about how he was sent into the world because of God's love for the world. Jesus explained that he must be lifted up on the cross for us. Those who will believe in him, or those who may come to believe in him, to receive eternal life. Well, that happened much earlier in the Gospel of John back in chapter 3, and now we are in chapter 12. That lesson that Jesus taught and explained is now getting a whole lot more real. The hour has now come. It's time. Jesus is about to be lifted up. Jesus is about to perform his ultimate act of service for us by going to that wretched cross and being the fullest extent of love ever known. From here, Jesus says and does final things before his death in the Gospel of John. One of those things coming up is his teaching on the greatest form of love, to lay down one's life for one's friends, which Jesus is about to do, which he's preparing to do. He's preparing his heart and his mind and his soul to do. Jesus' soul is about as troubled as it gets in the Gospel of John. In this passage, uh, we find one of those places where Jesus' confidence in what he's doing really stands out. Now my soul is troubled. But what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It's for this reason that I've come to this hour. Now compare that with the Gospel of Mark, where he says, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want quite the opposite from what he's saying today in the Gospel of John. Although it's still the same, ultimately, because he's still, it's still pointing to his willingness to go where he's got to go. Mark, along with Matthew and Luke, are older than John. John is the youngest of the Gospels, and I wonder if this is an example of the writer of the Gospel of John deciding to show Jesus questioning less this whole thing he's got to do. Because if Jesus is questioning this ultimate form of love, 
then he seems more like us than that divine manifestation of God on earth. How many of us are ready and willing to lay down our lives for those we love? Not to mention people we don't even know. We can think of those special people among us who voluntarily put their lives on the line for us, those folks in the military and the police force and firefighters, hospital workers, especially during the time of a pandemic, and even uh, frontline workers in grocery stores and elsewhere providing important things that we all need to keep going, even when they're in harm's way to do that. Now, of course, a lot of these folks are doing it ultimately for a paycheck, uh, risking their own lives uh, for some form of compensation, you know, for their own survival, for their family's survival to live uh, while others are out there just doing it simply for their love of country or for their love of other people in general. And then some of those folks out there do it completely for free, requiring great sacrifice with no compensation at all. To be a, a volunteer firefighter, a soup kitchen worker, food pantry worker, whatever else, those doing it completely for free are probably most among us like what Jesus did for us. Yet even those doing it completely for free are not going into it expecting to die. That's where we find Jesus today in the Gospel of John, expecting to die. Serving, going, and being God's love, knowing that's exactly what's going to get him killed. Whether looking at the version in Mark or the version in John, it's obvious that this is not something Jesus wants to do. It's obvious that this is something that troubles him deeply to the furthest depths of his soul. You know, let's say you're volunteering in the soup kitchen during a pandemic. And your shift is tonight. So, of course, it's already risky just going there during a, a pandemic, right? But, but you've heard from a very reliable source that some guy is definitely going to storm into that soup kitchen tonight with a gun and shoot up the place, and he's aiming directly for you. You know, like that man did on in those spas this week in Atlanta, murdering those eight innocent people. With that being the case, would you go and serve your shift at the soup kitchen tonight? Probably not, right? Now, now, even if you knew that God was calling you personally to go serve your shift, to die in that senseless tragedy so that God can use that senseless tragedy to give eternal life to those who will believe because of it, to give the world salvation. Still probably not, right? And, and if you're answering yes to those questions, how would you feel? Where would you be in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, in your feelings? Where would you be in this moment of trial leading up to death? Like the divinely confident Jesus saying, although my soul is troubled, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? Of course not. This is why I'm here. Or would you sound like the less confident Jesus in Mark saying, Abba, remove this cup from me. I don't want it. But fine. If you say so, I'll go. Or would you be more like... Um, that, that's stupid. I can't do that. I, I can't do it. I can't serve the ship tonight. I, I've got to think about my family. What are they going to do without me? Besides, I don't want to die. And sure, maybe there is some, some great people out there worth dying for, but there's a whole lot more of those not-so-great people who do not deserve it. And carrying on with more and more reasons to justify not going through with it. 
Well, I dare to say that not so many of us love the world that much. Now, in my experience, uh, I think of, of foot washing. In my experience, Every time I've ever been part of a foot washing church service as Jesus washes his disciples' feet in the next chapter of John, very few of us in our world and culture and time today feel okay with washing each other's feet. Now, sure, it's not commonplace today in this part of the world in this time, but even so, in Jesus' time and place, that was the job of a servant, of a slave. Certainly not the Messiah, not anybody else with any level of status in society. It's not like that form of service was comfortable for them at the time any more than it is for us now. I'm just saying, it took an awful lot of love for Jesus to wash his disciples' feet. Multiply that exponentially for Jesus to die not only for his friends, but for all of us who may or may not befriend him after he dies for us. I don't know how much Jesus himself loved the world. Now in that famous teaching from last week, Jesus taught us about how much God loves the world. Jesus didn't say anything about how much he loved the world apart from God's love. In some cases, in the Gospels, we can see Jesus' love for the world, particularly for those who suffer and for those showing humility, for those with faith. But in other cases, we can see his contempt for the world, calling religious leaders Hypocrites and foxes and snakes and turning tables and cracking the whip in the temple. Now in the Gospel of John with Jesus' divine confidence, it seems that his own love for the world overrides his contempt for it. Now in Mark, with Jesus crossing his fingers that God will change the plan, it seems that he had to look far beyond himself for God's love to carry him forward through the whole ordeal because his own personal love for the world just maybe wasn't quite there yet. Unlike in the Gospel of John, in Mark, Jesus doesn't seem so ready to be that seed that has to die to bear fruit for the world to eat to live. Now, whichever version of Jesus we lean on most, it all comes down to God's love and Jesus' love coming together as one. It's probably safe to say that for most of us, our love for the well-being of the world just isn't quite there yet. I know mine's not. I know I have to bite my tongue sometimes. I got to take a deep breath. I got to rely on God to do some of this stuff that I'm called to do as a Christian. And sometimes I'm not even able to do that. And I know that I'm not alone. I mean, think of the songs that we're singing today. Us coming back into the heart of worship. Whose heart is the heart of worship? It's obviously not ours if we're coming back to it. That's God's heart. Lord, whose love through humble service. Whose love? Not ours. God's love. A love far beyond our own. Abide with me. Because I can't do this without the one far greater than myself, even closer to me than next to me with me in my soul. And in a few moments, I could sing of your love forever because only a love far beyond our own would dare to go head to head against evil and all kinds of darkness and death to drive out the ruler of this world with humble service, like foot washing, and selfless sacrifice, like being lifted up on a cross. 
to truly believe in Jesus is to invite God's love for the world to become our love for the world. To become one and the same. No matter whether that be with a divine confidence or very reluctantly. To believe in Jesus and what Jesus is doing is to search ourselves and ask ourselves some heavy questions. Do the decisions I make in my life come from love? Are my decisions based on my love for God, my love for my neighbor, and my love for myself? In the likely case that our love has not quite come together with God's love as one, then are our decisions at least based on God's love for us? Or are we only thinking of ourselves and what we want? The prophet Jeremiah spoke long before the time of Jesus about a new covenant that would arrive someday. And then in Jesus, we see what that new covenant looks like. God's love, which is far beyond our own, being written on our hearts. Blending together with our own love, becoming our very being. May we live into this new covenant in which we are called to serve humbly like Jesus serves. In which we are called to go, to follow where Jesus goes. To become more what Jesus is. God's love for the world. May we serve the Lord. May we dare to follow the Lord. And in one way or another, may we be the love this world needs.